All right, in this video, we're going to be looking at mutations again for one last time to uh, talk about mutations. We're going to talk about how natural selection is directly affected by um, mutations, or I guess would probably be the say, better way to say it, uh, natural selection acts on mutations. And then we're going to look at what's called horizontal uh, genetic variation as well, or horizontal acquisition of genetic uh, information. <clears throat> so natural selection, um, to give it a nice textbook definition is the process in which organisms better adapted to a particular environment have a high chance of survival and reproduction, thereby, thereby passing those adaptations on to the next generation. So here you have some variation in giraffes. You have a uh, little neck over here. You have um, the uh, mama giraffe, I guess, and the, this is baby mama and daddy giraffe. And uh, in this case, the uh, the taller one is going to get the uh, the tree and is going to live and is going to be able to pass its genes on to the next generation, whereas the shorter giraffes are not going to be able to do that. And so you expect these shorter versions of the giraffe to die off over time because they're not able to get the food. They're not able to compete with this one. These die off. This one survives. That is simply what natural selection is. Natural selection is driven by death. Uh, it is driven by the death of the inferior species. And so why do these variations exist? Because there, it, there's variations on the genes underlying these phenotypic changes. There are some there are some examples, you know, where you could have these two giraffes are actually different height because this one just didn't get fed right when it was a baby or something like that. But in general, um, these are going to be directly direct, related to genetic changes. Those those genes are passed from one generation to the next. You'd expect for taller giraffes to begin to get the countryside and smaller giraffes begin to get eaten by lions. And so let's talk about horizontal gene transfer. Um, horizontal gene transfer is basically the exchange of genetic uh, information between unrelated individuals. What does that mean? Um, well, it just means that there, there's an exchange of information, but there's not necessarily any kind of reproduction going on. This isn't asexual or sexual reproduction but it's just the transfer of information. And we're, so you'll, it'll make more sense as we go through them. Uh, it's not, um, you're not giving information down to your offspring. You are, it's a horizontal sort of exchange of that information. We're going to list four different examples here. Three of them are on this particular slide. Let's talk about transformation. Uh, used to, we talked a lot about this particular experiment from how, one named Howard Griffith in the early 20th century who discovered this idea of genetic uh, transformation and um, refers, basically what transformation is, it refers to the uptake of DNA from an outside source. Um, so in this particular experiment, you have a mouse that is injected with a non-virulent strain and it lives a mouse that is injected with a virulent strain and it dies. In this trial, they took the virulent strain and they killed it. So it's not active and they injected that in the mouse and it lived. All right. So what would happen if you combined this one that doesn't kill mice and this one that also doesn't kill mice, but has the genes, has the DNA of the ones that did, right? If they're just dead, that DNA is just there, but it's not doing anything. Well, if you combine these two, the, the living DNA will uptake that dead DNA that allowed them to be killers, and that will cause the mouse to die because those, those bacteria have been transformed by that outside DNA. This primarily occurs in prokaryotes, but can happen in eukaryotes also to a lesser extent, obviously, because most eukaryotes are multicellular. Um, but we will actually do a lab of bacterial transformation where we change some bacteria, causing them to have a different sort of phenotypic expression. All right, transduction uh, refers to the uptake of DNA also, but it, it specifically involves a virus, all right? So the DNA is being injected into the host or into the, um, I guess you would call it the host in this case, um, through a virus. So here's a bacteria. This virus is injecting its DNA. That DNA becomes integrated into the host. The host makes more copies of the virus. And over time, that DNA, that viral DNA, is going to be just become part of the host DNA um, 
genome. We have viral DNA in our own genomes that are part of the genome and have been there for centuries and centuries. Um, some of that through our own our own uh, quest through civilization in order to be more and more immune to the things that are here. Some of that through vaccinations, as we have been vaccinated over the course of years for several different things that would have caused us disease. Um, and so this that would be an example of that as well. <clears throat> Conjugation is uh, the horizontal exchange of DNA where two organisms actually connect to one another and they exchange DNA like the cell to cell transfer. Um, basically you have two different kinds of bacteria. Um, nothing, no details here are required, but I'll share them just to make it easier to talk about. So you have one that can produce this thing called a pillus or sometimes you'll see it called a sex pillus or oh, in one that can't and they hook up together in this little tube, this conjugation tube allows the transfer of plasmid DNA. And so this plasmid is called an F plasmid in this case. I don't know what that means, but it's just some sort of DNA that this guy over here doesn't have. Well, this one is going to make a copy of it and give it to them. And at the end, they both have that DNA. And so this conjugation, again, it's a horizontal swapping. It's not, there's no creation of a new offspring. It's just one bacteria sharing information with another bacteria. And this is also happening in prokaryotes. And then finally, it's translocation. And this has to do with chromosomes specifically. Uh, you can see the different examples here. Um, <clears throat> essentially what's going on, this is when portions of a chromosome are changed. So this is showing maybe uh, three sections of a chromosome and one of those sections becomes duplicated. All right or one of those sections becomes deleted, or an entire section of a chromosome becomes inverted. So instead of A, B, C, you have, then you have C, B backwards and E, D backwards here. So that's kind of what's going on. Translocation is literally where part of a chromosome just changes location and becomes a, a part of a different chromosome, right? And so that can happen as well. All of these things um, can be bad or could be good. An example of duplication being a good thing is the duplication of the uh, gene sequence for salivary glands, for instance, in reptiles allowed some of those salivary glands to become specialized to create venom. And this is how you have like snakes or venomous lizards or some other things out there, which is pretty fascinating. Um, and that's occurred several times separately because you have venomous snakes and you have non-venomous snakes and uh, anyway, that's that's uh, beyond the scope of this class, but that just shows you an example of how duplication can actually be a good thing for a particular type of organism. Um, and then there's one thing to talk about too, which I think is fascinating, is this idea of viral combination. Um, so we are examples of organisms that can be influenced by viruses. Um, we've found that out over the last couple of years uh, as, as much as we wanted to find it out ever possibly. And uh, so let's say that you... <clears throat> come down with a particular strain of the flu, all right? And then uh, you're also interacting with pigs, and they a virus that pigs only are affected by, also um, you get it. And those two viral DNA actually kind of match up or combine, and they make this whole new type of flu, right? Um, and so... And then you have the same sort of thing here. You have a bird flu, which kind of is able to mutate to where pigs can get it. And then these two pigs have different kinds of viruses and they combine. And through the combination, it creates something that humans are able to contract, which is, you know, sometimes you'll see these, they're called after the animals that have them, like the swine flu, which is what H1N1 is, or the bird flu. Um, mostly that sort of thing is used by media to just to make you scared. Um, but this is how, um, this is how viruses mutate over time is they are able to combine in hosts and then, uh, create a new strain through that. And, uh, you can trace it if you, um, know what you're doing. Um, but there's a way to do that. And so all of the, all the viruses can, you can see, you can kind of trace their, um, their patterns. And this is how we are able to name mutations and all that sort of thing that we have all become familiar with at this point. And then lastly, just to talk about variation that's created through sexual reproduction, 
Uh, we've talked about this before. Uh, sexual reproduction is inherently um, able to create variation just because of all the processes involved. If you think back to meiosis, things like independent assortment, uh, the law of segregation, where the little a and the big A are going to be separated, and so an individual has the chance to create or have the little a. Um, if four sperm cells are made every time meiosis happens, and um, though each of those sperm cells can go with any number of eggs, and so those combinations are also unique. Um, crossing over adds variation as well in sexual reproduction, and so sexual reproduction has become the dominant form of reproduction on the planet because of this inherent variation able to produce variations that lead to ultimately better adaptations.